Welcome to Virtual Abilities 2019 Mental Health Symposium. My name is Kat Tenen. I'm 71, semi-retired, and 11 years old in SL as of yesterday. In SL, I can dance, create, work, and play in ways I can't do in real life. Am I addicted? I don't think so. But I'll listen to our next presenter, Dr. Tony Van Roy, and find out. Dr. Van Roy's talk is titled Gaming, Problem Gaming, and Gaming Addiction in the Netherlands, an Introduction. Dr. Van Roy is project leader for gaming, gambling, and media literacy in the Trimbos Institute the Netherlands Institute of Mental Health and Addiction in Utrecht. I hope I got that right. His research interests are in development of serious games, game-based learning, and mental illness assessment. In this presentation, Dr. Van Roy will introduce concepts that can help us understand gaming addiction more easily. He prom promotes the responsible and healthy use of video games. He will use the situation in the Netherlands as an example to explore concepts of healthy and unhealthy gaming. I remind you to turn off your mics and, and refrain from questions or comments until the end of the presentation. So as time is short, please join me in welcoming Dr. Von Roy to the podium. Thank you. All right. See if I can figure this out. Yeah, there we go. So um, I'm assuming I can uh, I can uh, be understood uh, with the voice. Otherwise, uh, just insert uh, some questions and I can see if I can fix it. But I'm sure it's fine. So my name is uh, my name is Tony, and I've been working on uh, gaming addiction, uh, the subject of gaming addiction for, I guess, the majority of my career now, starting with. Um, starting with survey research among uh, Dutch high school students and ending up now in a position where we do prevention efforts in the Netherlands for gaming problems. Uh, I'll not exactly be following my teleprompter slides, but they should be uh, addressing the core of my message. So that said, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty obvious to, to people and to me as well that there are a lot of concerns about uh, how much screen time is healthy and this is actually you see this quite easily if you go into Google and you actually go into uh, the, the, the function that uh, adds uh, text to your questions and there you can see that people are very much concerned about how much uh, screen time is enough how much gaming time is enough and I even if you look for uh, the word addiction then it supplements gaming internet mobile phone use quite often um, in addition to what you would expect uh, like uh, for example, alcohol or heroin. So there's uh, definitely something going on in the public perception. There's also something going on in my personal experience with the subject because uh, it's, it's not exactly a secret that I've always been a, a, a gamer from a young age. Uh, but it was only in 2005 with the introduction of World of Warcraft that I actually started meeting people in games um, more extensively. And uh, I, I often use this example of a guy I knew in Warcraft called Stealth. He was very successful in the game and he had uh, a large amount of equipment. He was running his own guild. He was basically achieving a lot in the game. So it was actually quite surprising to me that one day he uh, suddenly decided to quit the game. He wrote a dramatic post on the forum. He announced he would quit the game and that would be the end of it. Because uh, as a perfectionistic uh, person, he focused too much on World of Warcraft and it basically to the detriment of his uh, study performance. So he decided to quit. He tried to anyway, because he was back a week later and the last time I checked a few years later, he was, he was still playing extensively. So there was one of, uh, one of the people I met in Warcraft that really made me think about uh, what, what's going on with some people and excessive play, which is what got me started in my PhD research. All right, 
So throughout this pres fairly brief presentation, I, I will introduce two concepts that I like to use to understand uh, gaming problems. And they are um, basically uh, the fish trap, a very Dutch uh, device to uh, collect fish. And it is a device where uh, the, harder, the, the further the fish swims into the trap, the harder it is to get out again. Because there's a very small entrance and there's a, you can only basically, and the, the, so it's hard to swim back, but it's easy to swim forward because the hole to the next area is, um, relatively speaking, a lot bigger. Secondly, uh, I like to use the onion as an example, because I think in understanding gaming addiction, it's really helpful to go through a number of layers of understanding. And, and the first one um, for me is basically media. Uh, we're all exposed to uh, media portrayals of games and very often they're heavily polarized. So it's either games are going to save the world by um, enabling people to become healthy or solving certain problems or vice versa. Uh, there's a large debate about aggression and very often about addiction. So it's good to understand that the, by definition, the media is portraying fairly polarized images of, of, uh, of gaming, uh, specifically gaming addiction as well. And they tend to blame a single actor. So it's either the companies that are creating uh, products that are uh, abusive, or it's the players who should basically have more self-control, or it is the parents who are basically responsible for not paying enough attention to their child and using the game as a digital nanny for all sorts. So very enough, very often it's reduced to a simple, uh, an oversimplified situation, where in reality I think they're all interacting and they're all quite relevant. Now, if we look cross-culturally, there's a fairly, um, fairly big difference between countries, and, and the specific best example of that is the Asian countries. And in this case, we see an image from China where uh, children are basically after gaming too much are re-educated in military style re-education re camps. Now I'm, I'm fairly sure that these days they're uh, less prevalent than they used to be, but there's been some controversy uh, about the treatment of people in these camps, uh, including forced medication and forced electroshocks. So um, the concept of gaming addiction in, in the hands of certain governments can really have detrimental, concepts, uh, de detrimental cons consequences for persons, for sure. It's not something to be taken lightly, especially at a worldwide level. So the second layer of, um, I guess, a disclosure is, uh, can you trust me? Uh, up to a point, I guess. So I work at the, at the Trimbas Institute, and which is a government-sponsored institute, which does uh, basically health promotion. We tend to work on reducing tobacco uh, use in society, reducing alcohol use. And my specific thing is not necessarily to reduce game use, but definitely to understand problematic gaming better and gambling as well. See that in the next slide is some brief screenshots of some of the type of projects we do. They're very often they're, they're Dutch uh, uh, language, so they won't be too helpful, but I do have uh, some English text as well, if you're interested. Feel free to contact me. And basically, these efforts uh, focus in, in two areas, uh, both implementation and information for the general public, so prevention projects, and secondly, uh, more fundamental research. And we have done both, and I'm, I'm currently doing both. So, for example, I might be, right now, I'm developing a new uh, screening instrument for assessing gaming problems. Uh, second disclosure, I'm also a gamer, not a secret at this point. Uh, here I am in the middle. Very proud of this. Um, this we defeated a uh, Navarian, a boss in um, Blackwing Lair in World of Warcraft. This is the group I was playing with. I think at this point it was 40 people. And I often show this to the general audiences um, to basically address the question that people are achieving real things in these games. Okay? Because if people are not informed about games, they tend to think that uh, no accomplishments are, are going on, it's just a waste of time, it, it happens, those thoughts are, are somewhat prevalent. Uh, I think that we defeated this dragon was a, dragon was a real, uh, real performance. Uh, it was definitely difficult and there was a large release after we defeated it, everybody was happy. And as often happens, uh, try to defeat the dragon and then one, one person's mom gets angry and he has to leave the room and then you're screwed with 39 people. So many things are going on. It's complicated. But uh, as we're all in Second Life, I guess that's uh, already clear to some of you. 
So moving on to the actual uh, content and the Dutch situation, uh, I like to employ uh, for, for thinking about these subjects basically the fish trap model and I'll show a picture of it. The, the first, I guess the not even pictured here is the first level of uh, technology use which is basically it's beneficial. Uh, you work uh, all day or you do other things and then you decide to relax a little with a video game and it's I guess objectively demonstrable as well that it's beneficial. You get, you get richer, you get additional social contacts, you do something, fix your mind of things, relaxing. It's basically play is part of the healthy human functioning. However, uh, these days some people have um, some mild feelings of discontent about their either their Facebook use or their gaming and you might ask them uh, are you addicted to mobile phones uh, are you addicted to Facebook are you addicted to your games and they might say yes uh, actually uh, a fairly large percentage of people in research say yes uh, might be up to 20 or 30 percent even even if you ask them about social media use and I would label that Obviously, these people are not patients, but I would label that as, um, yeah, what I say here, mild feelings of discontent, self-report, there's something going on. This is another example of this line of uh, reasoning. This is Belgian research where we see uh, fairly high percentages here in the blue. It's like 20% of people that self-report that they have trouble getting away from Facebook. They might feel they should be doing less, but they're unable to do it. And that's that's fairly high percentages of people that self-report this. So interesting, uh, but from my perspective, uh, the, the first uh, step in understanding this. And it might also be an indication of something that's not even addiction, but just of other issues with the social media and how they treat people. Now, um, the second one, which is more directly related to excessive use and problems, it is pro what I would say is I define as problematic internet or gaming behavior, or if you will, problematic social media or problematic mobile phone. It doesn't really matter too much, although we see it mo uh, most often for gaming. Uh, and this includes basically all of the research that's out there. It involves survey research where people, uh, uh, researchers often go into schools, go into, go into universities or go into society. And they ask people about their gaming behavior and they say, they might say, do you have problems controlling uh, yourself? Have you tried to reduce your use and have been unsuccessful in it? Uh, does does uh, video gaming uh, create problems with your homework or with your uh, health even? And uh, very often in survey research, uh, a significant pr proportion of people say yes to this, even if you add up all the questions and generally arrive at like between one and 5% of people will be saying, will be indicating a number of problems in relationship to their gaming or internet. Uh, the, in the media portrayal of this, this very often this is referred to as addiction. So you might have a, a newspaper report in the Netherlands that says 10% uh, of Dutch adolescents are addicted to games. Um, while I personally, we'll see that in a bit, I personally prefer to reserve the term addiction or disorder for people that are seeing a therapist and are not in school anymore uh, filling out surveys. Uh, this is an example of an instrument that we might use uh, and it, it involves uh, some core components that cover a loss of control over the behavior, problems and interference with real life. And then very much like uh, w what the uh, researchers do with gambling, there are some associated phenomena. For example, preoccupation with the behavior, uh, people go gaming to mo modify their uh, own mood, so they might try to escape a bad mood instead of solving the underlying problems. And if they quit, they might experience uh, at least psychological withdrawal phenomena. Now, um, some actual empirical data from the Netherlands recently. I summarized uh, the HBASC, which is a fairly big study on uh, high school age students. And here it's, uh, unfortunately, the text in the slide is somewhat Dutch, but in the bottom it shows the percentage of male players that are for scoring high on risky or problematic gaming comes out among the boys to 7% of the players. And if we look at the, uh, the, the red area, which is uh, the group within the group, which is experiencing both a mental problem and a physical problem, 
So that might be obesity or being too light or not brushing their te teeth enough or not skipping breakfast a bunch of times. So that would be the physical things. And mental would be um, slightly more rigorous indicators of, uh, for example, depression or not feeling so well using the SDQ scale. So we see that in this group, although in absolute terms it's a, it's a small group, uh, within this group the, they score five times more likely to have these issues. So this is definitely a problematic group. They are gaming too much and they score high on these issues. And then you get a chicken or eggs uh, question of course, because if you're not feeling so well then it's very tempting to sit at home and have to fill your time with something. So you might end up playing games or watching Netflix. But the uh, unfortunate thing with games is that, I guess also the fortunate thing, is that they relieve uh, loneliness. They re make you feel like you accomplished something, which is great up until the point that it becomes a central part in your identity and a central part in your life. And that can really cause over the long run some, uh, some problems with your development, especially if you're young. So uh, very interesting, but not necessarily patients related per se. Although a bunch of these people might escalate to be patients. So that this is where I reserve the last category in thinking. And that would be the last part of the fish trap as well. People that are a disorder or have a gaming addiction. Um, this is not a large group. Uh, they do exist. And very often they have uh, comorbid issues. It's, it's actually fairly rare to find a gamer that is just gaming and has to see a clinician. Very often there's depression going on or uh, people are in the autism spectrum and are coping in, are not coping well with life in other ways. So there's, or there's problems in the family. It's very rarely an isolated issue, although it, it does happen. If you look at the, the numbers in the Netherlands, um, unfortunately we only have measurement, um, official measurement up to 2015. And nationally speaking, it's a small issue, like less of a percent within uh, the addiction the ad addiction care clinic uh, the addiction care treatment numbers for addiction so alcohol uh, at the national level for example is a much bigger problem however uh, more recently the, the measurements on the national level have stopped but uh, with the reports from the dutch youth clinics we hear that gaming problems are now in the youth clinics the second biggest problem in some places after cannabis so increasingly young people are coming into the clinics with their parents um, with severe problems in school in relation to the gaming behavior. And in some cases, um, in, in a significant number of cases, I suspect even there's, there, it's just panic among the parents about the gaming behavior because, you know, they'd rather their child was playing soccer than uh, become trying to become a pres professional in Fortnite. But in some cases there, there's actually something going on and there's a large, the therapists feel they have a large uh, need for a better grip, a better grip on this problem. Now looking at the um, diagnostic criteria, we, we have in 2013 the DSM-5 manual introduced a tentative preliminary c category for gaming disorder, which is um, I guess good in some ways, but I'm um, mainly negative about it because it's in practice people are only using the nine criteria copy paste from the nine criteria that the DSM mentioned. And they uh, also made up a uh, cutoff score for this skill, which is basically five, five out of nine or higher you score positive on gaming disorder. But the unfortunate thing is, is that there's only really two negative items in this list. So, uh, and many of them, uh, sorry about the Dutch, but many of them are actually, de they deal with preoccupation, for example, that's the first. You're thinking about games a lot. Uh, from my perspective, that's not an ideal question. Uh, secondly, there's a, a number of debatable criteria in there. So, for example, um, with, uh, withdrawal symptoms, non-physical. Uh, that makes a lot of sense with substances. With gaming, um, less so, I guess. Uh, and the third one is even more debatable, like, for example, tolerance. Uh, tolerance makes a lot of sense if you're drinking, because your body builds up a resistance. But in practice, people have started drafting uh, survey instruments that cover gaming and say, you need to buy uh, better computers all the time to feel equally equally good about your gaming. And I don't think that paints a very realistic picture of how people will participate in World of Warcraft. They tend to buy a new computer when their old one burns out, I think. 
So there's some unfortunate choices in there, uh, but it was, however, I guess, a starting point. Uh, and I guess the main um, the main risk with the DSM-5 approach is that people uh, they go blind to the things that are not in there. So they ma they might end up ignoring the, the nuances that really make gaming different from, for example, a substance use problem or even from a gambling problem. Uh, and we now have a new effort from the World Health Organization, uh, which also announced that they're uh, drafting a gaming disorder with there's actually some substantial debate about it, but they seem to be pushing forward with it. The fortunate thing um, is that uh, it really places, uh, unlike the DSM-5, in, in its implementation anyways, it really places a functional impairment uh, centrally. So the behavior pattern of gaming has to be of sufficient severity to result in significant personal uh, impairment in personal, fam family, social, educational, occupational, or other important areas of functioning. That's great, because that will really help us in dealing with people that um, might be pre-judgmental about gaming or have a limited understanding. You can say, well, it's not been a year and the, f the functional uh, impairment might not be big enough. I guess it would, would have been nice if they made an exception, for example, for professional esports, but um, it's a starting point. But again, like with the DSM-5, you have to, you have to ask if, um, if we're, we might be missing some central aspects of gaming by reducing the gaming disorder to just this very central and obviously important criteria. And if we look at the history of, uh, for example, uh, gambling disorder, we see actually a similar pattern where people uh, historically gambling in the DSM-3 was phrased as a loss of control over gambling, leading to significant problems, pretty much exactly what we have now for gaming disorder. But later on, we added um, we added a criteria like chasing your losses, which is very gambling specific. You try to win back your money. Lying is also a very central criteria in, in gambling because you lose your money and then you start hiding things from family and people around you because you're very much ashamed of your consequences of your secret behavior. So it might well be that this is a starting point for, um, for a more nuanced understanding in the future. I, I hope it is. Um, like I said, there was substantial uh, debate about this disorder. I participated in this debate as well, but uh, I'm personally at the point now where I say uh, we have to deal with it. I guess it's it's helpful in the sense that we now can address, we have a clear universal label worldwide to uh, deal with the patients better, but uh, it's definitely good to be critical. Now some practical notes. We see uh, actually, unfortunately, uh, mainly due to the debate, I guess, but it might also be a historical trend that always happens. Uh, industry is not very responsive in public to this issue. And what we see mainly is that some initial uh, attempts from, uh, in this case, telecom providers and Dutch uh, game addiction, uh, game industry lobby organizations are uh, shifting attention to the role of parents. So this is, uh, I guess, helpful because it, ha it takes away the misunderstandings about gaming somewhat. And our first advice is also from our organization is also for parents to play along with their children so they know what's going on and they can better coach and help their children in the game. But for now, industry is limiting its role to that. So this is unfortunate, I think, because they are in possession of basically all the data and all the opportunities for meaningful intervention. For example, if a person is showing an excessive behavioral pattern of play, this would be an excellent opportunity to provide some uh, targeted reach out or provide channels to healthcare or basically even ask if some if uh, everything is all right with the person. But uh, these types of more proactive interventions are not happening in this industry yet. And even in the public debate, there's uh, some flat out denial that even something is going on, which is uh, unfortunate because uh, in some cases there definitely is a match between the product and a certain personality type. and, and it clicks and people get, go out of control. And the product does play a role in that. I guess a simple way to understand that would be uh, extreme achievement uh, types uh, in, in games. So World of Warcraft, for example, went through a phase where you could only become a general by basically doing 24 hour shifts behind your keyboard. And that really promoted excessive behavior. So once they removed that, people started playing less in that uh, type of uh, battle mode, I think. So they do, they do have an influence and they can have a positive impact, I, I think. It's unfortunate, they, unfortunate that the debate is polarized in this way. 
what we are personally doing now is, uh, like I said, we have a website, gaminginfo.nl in this case. We provide uh, video materials about acceptance of gaming, but also tips from pro gamers uh, and parents themselves to deal with gaming in a family setting. Uh, we have a telephone line. Like I said, we're also working on a better and new self-test that at least covers the new uh, World Health Organization criteria and the DSM-5 criteria. And we tend to uh, operate with a stepped care approach where in initially we try to promote a nuanced uh, understanding of gaming. Uh, there's many benefits, but keep an eye on the risks. But if people do require professional help, we also provide the opportunity to reach out to professional healthcare in the Netherlands. So that's uh, something we do. And finally, right now we're focusing on um, a healthy school and behavior program within which we're developing an e-learning module to help teachers recognize gaming problems in the classroom. And herein we have, for example, uh, cases of students that, that might be sleepy in the classroom or they might be overly involved in gaming. And we have some cases where the teacher is overreacting, but we also have some cases where something is actually going on an effort to educate teachers about this issue. Uh, and finally, what we find uh, very interesting is um, using some teleprompter clicks here now. Sorry about that. Finally, we're also working on uh, early intervention programs like uh, the Motivir program, which is an established program already, but not scientifically validated in which a uh, trained prevention worker uh, goes into the school and if a student is experiencing problems, for example with cannabis or in this case gaming, they have four structured uh, meetings using motivational interviewing to uh, help the student uh, change their behavior if they're open to change. So in an often case it's, this tends to help really well. So that's, uh, that's it. I hope that's clear. I'll be around for the panel and for questions anyway. So. I hope you uh, you enjoyed this. Thank you. So I guess I see the first question from uh, Mook Wheeler. Let me read this because it's quite the question. Do you want me to read it or do you want to read it, Tony? Um, I, I can read it. You, so you questioned. You said that the high addiction uh, levels involve, involved gaming rather than mobile phone use. Would you say this is because of the intensively immersive and comprehensive experience of the gaming environment? Oh, it's dropping out. The chat, chat box is disappearing. Oh, it's a one on one question, I guess. No, I'm lost. Where's the question? Ah, there it is. Yeah. Um, sorry, guys. That is, the more you involve the whole body, mind, senses, visual, sound, social interaction, adrenaline, emotions, physical action, etc., the worse the addiction. The more complete the human experience, the more gripping the addiction. Uh, well, thank you for that question. Um, I do have an opinion about that. I would say, generally speaking, that games on mobile phones are designed to be played uh, for a limited amount of time. Uh, people tend to uh, people tend to wear out on them after approximately four to five months, and, and this is why every four to five months we have a new variation of uh, Gardenscape or Candy Crush or those types of games. Uh, they're just very fundamentally different than uh, games in which you have more uh, community building oriented uh, activities. And uh, for example, if you take World of Warcraft, uh, first of all, it's a role-playing game, so you tend to build something. Uh, secondly, there is a, a reputation mechanism, so uh, people respect what you do in the game. And uh, we only see, basically, we only started seeing more gaming addiction problems from the emergence of World of Warcraft. So uh, right now, uh, many uh, players with problems in the Netherlands anyway are uh, are re reporting those in relation to competitive play. They decide they want to become esports persons and they, legitim they legitimize uh, using games for hours on end in that way. And eventually uh, they figure out they don't have a chance, but then they've already lost significant time and opportunities. 
So um, your, I think your hypothesis might make sense, but from my perspective, it has a lot more to do with uh, the feelings of, I guess, competence, relatedness, and uh, autonomy that people get in the game. So it really fulfills a number of a number of their needs, and it can create uh, these types of games can create a sort of uh, yeah, like I said, a fish trap or a situation a situation where you start over evalu uh, over evaluating the worth of that online presence. So th does that make sense? Thank you. I think so. Um, Joey Obama has a question for you. He says, how we define what is a game is changing a lot these days. Many would not consider themselves a player of games a few years ago, but they now play casual games and are more accepting of games as part of their life. And he wonders how this will affect humanity as a whole over time. <laughs> wow. <laughs> um, a very interesting question. Um, I'll keep it pragmatic. And maybe uh, Nick Bowman, who is uh, far more uh, schooled in these uh, wide-ranging communication uh, topics re in relation to games uh, can uh, address that later on when he's on. Um, I would say that uh, from my perspective um, there's just a bigger market for games right now. So more demographics are being drawn into groups, uh, into gaming, and we see this uh, basically with Nintendo Wii was one of the primary examples for that, and a brilliant one by Nintendo. Basically, they started addressing uh, exercise-related uh, crowds. They started addressing elderly people, very young people. So there's really just a, simply a bigger market for games. The fortunate thing is that uh, it tends to create more acceptance for games, which is a good thing. The unfortunate thing is that right now you see that the, the, the biggest game companies tend to be acting a little bit opportunistically. So, for example, we had a big scandal with the loot boxes uh, last year where big companies are basically just they from my perspective they tend to just make make the money they can make uh, as easily as they can which right now it is a gambling type uh, opening of boxes in games and then they just figure out when uh, to what point people start complaining about it and then it's removed i think that's that's an unfortunate uh, development in gaming which i don't really like so, um, yeah, it's not as fundamental as changing uh, humanity. We might in the end. I guess in that sense, virtual reality is uh, one of the more interesting ones. But I'm not really in a position to judge that, but it might be for now just a niche area. With That's definitely more, more of a fundamental game shift, I think, than uh, right now uh, gaming might be. But like I said, that's just speculation. And Nick, I think we're going to have to get to your question in the panel. Perhaps we can do that. Let's do a real quick answer for Cat's Eye from Tony. Um, what about the problem with product makers that their profit motive is tied in with increasing commitment to the game and even perhaps addiction? She's asking, is there a need for regulation? Um, so the answer would be absolutely yes. Uh, and it might be self-regulation. So uh, in my, uh, to the extent that I communicate with the gaming industry, I uh, tend to emphasize that I think it's really crucial that they start drafting some uh, industry-wide ethical uh, guidelines on what they do. Because, um, well, first of all, uh, like I said, there's basically very big opportunities for guiding people towards care and nothing is happening. Uh, so I understand it is a PR disaster if you get unilaterally connected with addiction. But on the other hand, if you see people in your products with games, with problems, then I think you have some sort of responsibility to act on it from a social responsibility type of uh, corporate activity. If they don't, then uh, the, uh, unfortunately the only alternative cause of action would be for governments to intercede and governments to regulate the industry, which is uh, unfortunate because that's pleasant. But right now I can see it going in that direction because like I said, the media debate is increasingly, unfortunately, polarized. It's already happening, by the way, regulation. So uh, the, the, the Dutch Gambling uh, Authority has uh, moved to ban certain types of loot boxes from Dutch games. Or games that operate on the Dutch market, and the Belgian uh, gambling authority has done the same. 
because uh, loot boxes uh, basically are in Belgium gambling and they uh, fall under criminal law. So they really have issues if they keep doing that. I will point out that Lay's comment is an important one. It will be translated and kept in the transcript. But unfortunately, we're going to have to say thank you to Tony for this session because we need a little bit of time to set up for the panel. And Tony's going to be on that panel, so you'll hear more from him in just a little bit. So please thank our speaker and let's, Tony, we're going to get you off the stage because we're going to put chairs out there. <laughs>